Lacan's concept of the death drive, perhaps we should say Lacan's reconceptualization of the death drive, is in some respects something of a challenge to many notions and ideas of the death drive as it's been typically understood. Every now and again, I'm tempted to say Lacan is more subversive, even iconoclastic in respect of Freudianism than we may suspect, even despite that he often makes this gesture of saying, I'm the true Freudian as opposed to you. And I think the death drive gives us a very good example of that. Lacan is at the same time going to dispense with many of the constituent elements of Freud's idea of the death drive, particularly the organic and biological implications that typically go along with that notion. But at the same time, he's also going to highlight certain key coordinates within the Freudian concept and, and strike a certain fidelity to those concepts. So in this series of short talks on the death drive, we will look at both of those things. We'll get a sense of both how Lacan uh, differs from, departs from, certain moments in Freud and post-Freudian thinking, whilst emphasizing, redeveloping, uh, uh, deploying certain facets of Freudian thinking that may seem in some respects to go beyond Freud, whilst nevertheless you could say remaining faithful to the very letter of Freudianism. So one comment, introduction, I've given a reading suggestion down here. The, these talks are uh, in many ways derived from a paper that I've done on this topic of the Lacanian death drive. And I mentioned that the paper is entitled Symbolic Mortification. It's in the journal Psychoanalysis and History. And the reason I mention that is I'm going to use a fair amount of Slavoj Žižek. In some respects, he's our tour guide. Uh, he's our tour guide of a concept. And I know there are Lacanians who would say, well, we should focus purely on Lacan here and not get too uh, distracted by the more philosophical elaborations of someone like Slavoj Žižek. And in this paper, I do suggest that at times we need some critical distance between the two. But in terms of an astute, colorful, animating uh, introduction to the Lacanian concept of the death drive, I think we couldn't ask for a better tour guide. Than so we're going to be drawing on his work a fair amount as well. So let's now begin. And if we're going to take these first two or three or four steps into the Lacanian reconceptualization of the death drive, we should bear something in mind. And that is, leave your ideas at the door. We've got a whole series of preconceptions of what the death drive is. And what we're going to do in the first two of these talks is to, following uh, Zizek's work, put those to one side. In fact, we're going to, in some respects, quite uh, in an animated fashion, we're going to oppose those. So you'll see four of them up here on the chalkboard. One of them, perhaps one of the strongest, is simply to say that the death drive is not biological. It's not some kind of function of the organic. It's not to be understood within the remit of the physiological, the biological, the bodily. It's, it's not simply to be reduced to that level. So this is the first assertion, and, and that will fly in the face of many Freudian and post-Freudian notions of what this death instinct might be. Number two, it's not to be understood as Thanatos. This is the kind of uh, uh, term that is often given to death drive, death drive as opposed to eros. Uh, and the Lacanian argument here is that this kind of dualistic opposition between life forces and deathly bound forces or a, a life agency and a death agency, it doesn't quite do justice to the concept. And what we'll start to find here is this recurring trait of Lacanian thinking, which Lacanians would say comes from Freud himself, is that rather than getting locked into this dualistic opposition, Euros, Thanatos, life force, death forces, that what one should rather do is ask how drive itself is, as it were, split from within, is not all, is, uh, is, is qualified with a kind of real fracturing within itself. So it's not, in Lacanian theory, sufficient to say life force and death force. Zizek doesn't like this, Lacan doesn't much like it, it sounds all a little bit Jungian, yin and yang, this kind of counterbalancing forces. Rather, the more radical dimension of death drive should be understood as how drive itself is 
split within, impossible unto itself. So, the second point, we should not, in a Lacanian frame, think about Thanatos at all, actually, but as death drive, as simply opposed or counterbalance with life drives. The third idea, it's not a Nirvana-like release of tension. And the fourth idea, maybe you could say this is perhaps one of the most important, is that when we think about death drive, it is not some kind of impulse, some kind of suicidal agenda, some impulse to self-annihilation. So those are our key ideas that we'll begin with, and we'll try to dismantle each of those conceptualizations, see how Lacan does something in a different way, see how Lacan mobilizes different concepts to try to understand death drive in the domain of symbolic activity, and also with reference to the notion of jouissance. Those things will be important. And in fact, you could say that maybe our two most important conceptual terms that we need to work with and work with again to do the Lacanian reformulation of Freud's death drive is number one, the notion of a kind of symbolic mortification, how symbolic activity, how in a way the repetitions of language themselves enable a kind of mortification, Symbolic mortification on the one hand, and on the other hand, how jouissance enables a kind of undeadness, a kind of going on, a kind of, dare I say it, a kind of immortality, a, a, a striving, a wish to continue, a, an animation, a kind of unholy animation that is not to be stopped, that brooks no uh, uh, pauses or, or obstructions, that wants to continue enjoying despite any restrictions of the pleasure principle, of what is uh, life-sustaining, of what is good for the organic survival of the entity. Those ideas. Symbolic mortification and undead life of jouissance. Those will be crucial. So that is what we need to say by way of our introduction. Let's just make two more points, and then we'll start to give some kind of theorization about why, for Lacanians, death drive is not biological. And how early-ish Lacan, Lacan in the 1950s, is going to try and say we need a different conceptual priority if we want to think death drive to some, rather than think it in terms of a biological sense. So we start then with a nice contradiction in terms. Lacan comes out all guns blazing and he says, all of you people who think you're interested in psychoanalysis, who think you're being Freudian, you are not psychoanalytic and you're not engaging with the spirit of the Freudian praxis, the Freudian revolution in thinking, in, in, in clinical practice, if you do not take death drive seriously. And of course, to say this is a bit of a rallying cry because we know that of all of Freud's concepts, one of the most controversial, at least amongst his immediate followers, is the notion of death drive. People can't get their head around it. People just don't seem to think that this is viable. Now, this is a contradiction of sorts, says Lacan, because surely, if you've done any kind of clinical work for any period of time, you will see many of the phenomena that Freud is battling with in the famous Beyond the Pleasure Principle. You will have seen them a great deal. What are they? Well, these are elements of repetition, psychical repetition. Again and again, you will find people, Freud's cases in uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, the start of the book, Freud is fascinated by a series of clinical challenges. And this is the key reason, Lacan's going to say, unless you engage, unless you think and utilize the concept of death drive, you are not properly psychoanalytic. Okay, so it's kind of a, as I mentioned, kind of a rallying cry. Um, but why then does he say that? Well. Freud gives us the, the problem that he's facing. Uh, one of them is the war neuroses. The war neuroses present us with a form of repetition, traumatic memories that don't stop coming, and they throw the subject into a seemingly traumatic situation of recalling awful things. Now, for Freud, up until this point, one of his crucial clinical ideas is that we should enable a clinic to do a kind of working through. What does working through mean? Well, working through seems to mean that when we're haunted by material or when we're grieving, for example, we need to do a kind of symbolic labor 
to speak it, to put it into words, to keep on speaking it out, to, as it were, in today's vernacular, process that material, maybe in Freud's own language, to overcome it is a better way of putting it. But the idea is, this is my way of thinking about it, is rather than being haunted by material, one tries to, as it were, metabolize that material through various forms of memory, through various work, forms of clinical work. But, says Freud, I'm finding some things that aren't, don't get worked through. Trauma, which repeats again and again, is one of them. But also, and it's a kind of brilliant move that he can pick these two different phenomena, which he would say are pretty similar, actually. If you look at a little kid playing a game, like his grandson, he's missing his mom, he's got a little toy, he throws the toy away, he brings it back. This is the famous Fort Dar game. It seems he's reenacting and trying to master a horrible situation by throwing the toy away, pulling it back, saying Fort Dar when he does this. And initially, Freud thinks that there's something hopeful here, that maybe there's ways of mastering overcoming something which is troubling, something which is kind of minimally traumatic. But ultimately, these activities don't necessarily seem to result in mastering the problematic material. So, one of the crucial beginnings of, one, right at the origin of Freud's theorization of death drive, are these troubling moments of repetition. Repetitions where the subject seems to be haunted they seem to reenact, they seem to repeat, they seem to repeat again and again rather than be able to work through, again in today's language, process those activities. So this becomes a crucial area for Lacan. We know that Lacanians don't want to biologize the death instinct. They want to think about it in terms that are not biological. And in that attempt, Lacan's going to say, let's try and foreground one of the most crucial concepts in Freud's initial clinical challenge in thinking about the death drive, and that's repetition. Then Lacan, being Lacan, the famous, you know, the supposed best reader of Freud up until a certain point, gives us a series of coordinates. He says, isn't it interesting that early on, prior to psychoanalysis, even properly being psychoanalysis, when Freud writes the project for scientific psychology, he is already being attentive to certain moments of repetition. And of course, he also highlights, Lacan, Lacan also highlights Freud's idea of the repetition involved in the repeated attempt to find the thing that has been lost, the attempt to refine something. So in all of these moments, we start to find that repetition is a crucial psychoanalytic concept. So much so that you could say that it's in the background animating the very notion of the unconscious. And for the time being, let's just take that seriously, because by the time Lacan has his famous seminar 11 on four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis. He's going to foreground repetition as one of the most crucial concepts in psychoanalysis. Now, to begin with, you could say, goodness me, I could think of a whole lot of other things that we could foreground prior to repetition. But I think Lacan is telling us this is crucial. This is a crucial element of human psychical functioning that we need to grapple with if we're going to do clinical work. And let's just underline that point just before we draw to a conclusion. The way that Lacan is coming back to death drive is to say that it's absolutely crucial for clinical work. Why? Because people repeat things that are traumatic. People self-sabotage. They have, to use Freud's uh, famous terminology, they have the situation of um, the negative therapeutic reaction. They, they seem to sabotage the very course of their own clinical work. So just by way of conclusion, I want to give you a couple of phrases from Freud's uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, just to give a sense that we're in the right wheelhouse, that we're looking at the right thing. And then in the follow-up lecture, we'll spend a little bit more time adding the Lacanian articulation of why he wants to encounter and think about repetition in a certain way. So I'm reading some uh, of Quinidos's book. This is a, a really helpful text if you want to, uh, not Lacanian by any means, but nevertheless, it's a good text if you want to be able to dip in and dip out of Freud's collected work and get uh, works and get some coordinates. And he pulls out a couple of uh, key phrases in his commentary on Beyond the Pleasure Principle. So Freud has the problem that with some patients, as we've seen, the processes of working through is unsuccessful. So that 
what was simply a case of repetition now turns into the compulsion to repeat. Repetition compulsion. Famous Freudian phrase, we've all heard that. The compulsion to repeat recalls past experiences which include no possibility of pleasure. These patients under the compulsion to repeat, uh, I'm reading Quinidos' words here, inevitably reproduce situations of unpleasure in the transference. They reproduce unpleasurable situations. Situations that have no possible uh, connection with pleasure. This is Freud directly. Patients repeat all of these unwanted situations and painful emotions in the transference, and they revive them with the greatest of ingenuity. They seek to bring out about the interruption of the treatment while it is still incomplete. Moving on a bit. The impression they give is of being pursued by a malignant fate or possessed by some demonic power. End quote. Quinidos offers something. At first sight, he says, such a person seems to experience this perceptual reoccurrence of the same thing in a passive manner, as if it is simply happening to them. However, analysis confirms that the person's behavior is in fact active in a certain way, even if not wholly conscious. Another quote from Freud, there really does exist in the mind a compulsion to repeat, which overrides the pleasure principle. So there we have some of the coordinates in the Freudian theorization. But my question, which we'll end with, is for Freud, repetition compulsion is the key concept. You will see it all over the place in clinical work. Self-sabotaging, traumatic reoccurrences, things which resist the clinical and therapeutic processes of working them through, of metabolizing them. They keep haunting the patient, and in some very significant sense, the patient keeps haunting themselves. How are we, there's a kind of self-agentic quality to that. How are we to account for that? Here's my question then, why is it that, although Lacan is speaking directly to these coordinates, he doesn't want to refer to repetition compulsion, but he rather wants to talk about repetition automatism. Why?